Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we'll discuss the events that occurred in 2006 in North Dakota. Mindy Morgenstern, 22, was a senior at Valley City State University but lived in an off-campus apartment. On September 13, 2006, her friend Tony Bauman went to her place after Mindy had not answered the phone all day. Tony knocked on the door, but no one answered. The door was unlocked, so she decided to go inside. She wasn't ready for what she had to face. Mindy was born on April 29, 1984 in Bogota, Colombia. She and her sister became adoptive children of Eunice and Larry Morgenstern, farmers from New Salem, North Dakota, USA. Larry and Eunice already had one daughter, Rebecca, but they always dreamed of a big family. First, they adopted a boy named Michael, and then 10 years later, they adopted a girl from Columbia named April. When Larry and Eunice discovered that April had a younger sister, Mindy, they adopted her too. Thus, Eunice and Larry had four children, three of whom were adopted. Mindy was their youngest child. Life on the farm was perfect for her. She loved to ride horses and play basketball. She helped her parents on the farm and even drove a tractor herself. After graduating high school, Mindy moved from New Salem to Valley City and immersed herself in student life. Being an outgoing and cheerful person, she quickly made many new friends. Mindy combined her studies and working as a waitress at a local restaurant. It seemed like the best years of her life were ahead of her, but all her plans and dreams got ruined. It was rather unusual for Mindy Morgenstern not to answer her cell phone or call her friends back. But that's what precisely happened on September 13, 2006. That's why her friends Tony Bauman and Danielle Holmstrom decided to check on her and went to her apartment. When they stopped on the other side of the street from her apartment, they saw Mindy's car in the parking lot. Danielle stayed in the car, and Tony went to Mindy's apartment on the second floor. She knocked on the door, but no one answered. The door was unlocked, so Tony decided to go inside and look around. It was dark. After taking a few steps, Tony saw something lying on the floor. When she turned on the light, she realized it was the dead body of Mindy. She had noticeable injuries on her neck. Tony was shocked. She ran outside and called Danielle, who was sitting in the car. The two of them entered the apartment. They were confused. There were knife wounds on Mindy's neck and an empty bottle of cleaning agent next to her. Its smell was all over Mindy's apartment. Danielle called 911 and reported the discovery of her friend's body. Hearing the noise, a man who lived on the same floor decided to check what was happening there. He walked up to Mindy, put his hand on her wrist, and after a few seconds said, I'm sorry, but your friend is dead. Soon after, the police arrived at the scene. Upon entering Mindy's apartment, the detectives immediately noticed the pungent smell of the cleaning agent. Mindy's body was lying across the living room. She had a belt wrapped around her neck and a broken knife sticking out of it. Its handle was lying next to her. Detectives concluded that the person who did this used a cleaning agent to try to destroy evidence. But fortunately, some evidence remained. Forensic experts found skin particles under the nails of Mindy's left hand. Mindy resisted and scratched the person who attacked her. Trying to determine what was the motive for the attack on Mindy, investigators immediately ruled out the version of a robbery that had gone bad. She had her purse in her right hand. Next to it was her phone and wallet with some cash. But whoever did it didn't take the money. Mindy's jewelry and other items that could be of interest to a robber remained untouched too. There was also a basket of clean laundry next to the body, and it looked as if someone had attacked Mindy the moment she entered the apartment with the laundry. There were no signs of forced entry on the front door. It could mean that the person who attacked Mindy either knew her or entered the apartment right after her. The next day, the detectives had to do the most complicated part of their job, informed the Morgenstern family that Mindy was dead. The news was heartbreaking for her parents, brother, and sisters. The family members didn't know anyone who might want to harm Mindy. She was friendly with everyone. Moreover, no one among her friends had problems with the law. Mindy's friends, Tony Bauman and Danielle Holmstrom, told investigators they were not the only ones in the apartment. 
A man who lived on the same floor came to Mindy's apartment to the sound of their screams. He checked Mindy's pulse and said she was dead. When investigators talked to the man, he said he checked her pulse with the back of his hand so as not to leave his fingerprints on Mindy's wrist. It seemed strange to the investigators. This man's name was Robert Linz. He had several scratches on his hands which made him a suspect in this case. The police took him to the station to ask some questions, and the number of those questions increased when they checked Robert Linz's background and found that he had problems with the law. They asked him about the scratches on his hands, and he said he had injured himself at work. According to him, he often had scratches on his hands because he worked with steel. When asked how he spent the previous day, he replied that he had been at work since 7 a.m. and returned home at about 5.30 p.m. The investigators contacted his employer and the latter confirmed it. He also confirmed that his employees often had scratches on their hands due to the job specifics. Although his alibi checked out, investigators were not ready to exclude Robert Linz from the list of suspects. They asked him to provide a DNA sample, and he agreed. The police sent the sample to the lab for comparison with the one found under Mindy's fingernails. The police interviewed all of Mindy's friends, but it didn't bring any results. Everyone said that Mindy had no conflicts with anyone. While waiting for the DNA results, the investigators interviewed her other neighbors. One of those who lived in the same building as Mindy was a corrections officer from the Barnes County Jail, Mo Gibbs. Gibbs knew the investigators involved in the case. They decided to talk to him, hoping he had seen or heard something. After all, being a corrections officer, he probably paid attention to things that other people didn't notice or considered unimportant. Mo married a girl with a child, and they all lived in the apartment next door. He came to the police station with a child. Therefore, one of the officers kept the child busy so that Mo could answer all questions without interference. The investigators said they wanted to talk with everyone who lived in the same building as Mindy. Mo Gibbs said that he served in the Navy from 1990 to 1999, but then he was fired for assault and served a prison sentence. However, he had no more law problems after becoming a free man again. Before becoming a corrections officer, he worked as a college guard. He allegedly had a night shift the day before Mindy died. In the morning, he returned home and started loading boxes into the car because he, his wife, and his stepdaughter were moving to another apartment. Mo said he didn't see or hear anything unusual. However, there was one thing that caught his attention, and it was the strong smell of the cleaning agent but he didn't bother to check where the smell came from because he was busy moving. Mo had scratches on his hands. He said he had injured himself while carrying the boxes. When the police asked Mo if he had ever been to Mindy Morgenstern's apartment, the man stated that he had been there once when he helped Mindy carry a laundry basket to her apartment. Investigators asked Mo Gibbs to provide a sample of his DNA for comparison, and he agreed without much hesitation. They let him go after taking his DNA sample. Investigators wanted to talk to everyone who knew Mindy well. They went to the restaurant where she worked and interviewed her colleagues. They found out that there was a visitor who made Mindy nervous. He lived in a trailer near the restaurant and went there almost daily. He was acting strangely, and Mindy said she felt uncomfortable around him. This man's name was Ralph, and the police decided to question him. He denied any connection to Mindy's death, saying he didn't know who she was at all. According to him, he never quarreled with anyone in that restaurant. Ralph did not have a reliable alibi, but he provided a sample of his DNA, which the police also sent to the laboratory for comparative analysis. Next, the investigators decided to chat with Mindy's boyfriend, Jordan Raynham. He, like Mindy, came from a local farming family and their relationship lasted more than a year. They went to the same church and that's where they met. Jordan had no problems with the law and had a good reputation in the city. Jordan seemed devoted to Mindy. He often took her home to spend time with his family. However, Mindy's parents told investigators that sometimes Jordan came to their farm unannounced and asked Mindy to come with him. It seemed like he was jealous. Yet Eunice and Larry did not believe that he could harm their daughter. 
The police asked Jordan to come to the station. The latter showed up there without delay. He was trying to help the investigators and answered the questions frankly. He said he saw Mindy the day before her death. They went shopping and were at a video rental shop. The next day, Mindy called him at 10.45 a.m. That was the day she died. They only talked once that day. And that was unusual for Mindy. She usually called Jordan 10 times a day, but this time she neither called nor answered. He thought she was busy and would call him back later, but she didn't. Jordan also told the police about his whereabouts at the time of Mindy's death. He allegedly worked on the family farm at that time. Investigators asked Jordan to provide a DNA sample and take a polygraph test. He agreed. During the polygraph test, Jordan was worried and his results were inconclusive. The police let Jordan go, sent his DNA sample to the lab, and started checking his alibi. But Jordan wasn't the only significant person in Mindy's life. Another potential suspect was Kyle Kuznia, Mindy's ex-boyfriend. They broke up more than a year before Mindy's death. However, there was something strange that happened after their breakup. Kyle Kuznia was the love of her life. They connected right away. Kyle met Mindy when she was a freshman. They had been dating for two and a half years, and Kyle often visited the farm of Mindy's parents. Her family loved him and treated him like their son. Mindy loved him very much. She thought she would marry him one day, but unfortunately for Mindy, there was no wedding. Kyle told investigators the story of his life with Mindy. He told how they met and that they immediately felt attracted to each other. The relationship lasted two and a half years and Kyle described it as ups and downs. They started to quarrel often. Kyle finished his studies at the university and needed to move on. He moved to another place, about an hour's drive from Valley City. Mindy was worried Kyle would find another girl. Being in a long distance relationship is a challenge. Therefore, according to Kyle, he decided to end it. They broke up, but Mindy tried to do everything she could to be with him. She wanted him back. Kyle told investigators he had met another girl and stopped communicating with Mindy after they broke up. But there was one night when Mindy came to his house to talk. It was about seven months before she died. Allegedly, Kyle told her to leave. He had nothing to say to her. Mindy got upset and left, and they haven't spoken to each other since. But sitting in the interrogation room a few days after her death, Kyle seemed to regret his behavior. He told them that Mindy had been in touch with his father, Rodney Kuznia, and it was very, very strange. Mindy's friends said Kyle's father called her several times a day. Sometimes it was just a few calls a week. Kyle stated that in his opinion, his father was attached to Mindy too much. At some point, he even asked his father to stop communicating with his ex-girlfriend. Kyle then mentioned that his mother found out about all these calls and was very upset. She told Rodney that it was wrong. After all, he was married. The Kuznia family genuinely liked Mindy. For her, communicating with Rodney was probably a way to keep some connection with Kyle. The police checked Mindy's voicemail and found something strange there. There was a voicemail message from Rodney Kuznia left after Mindy's death, in which he cried and said he was sorry this happened. The police found such a close relationship between Rodney and Mindy strange. Thus, they called him in for questioning. The first question they asked Rodney was the most obvious one. Why was he so attached to his son's 22-year-old ex-girlfriend? Rodney agreed that it was rather strange. According to him, he became attached to Mindy when she was dating Kyle. Rodney liked her, and she reminded him of his wife when she was young. At first, he and Mindy used to talk about Kyle. She always mentioned his son's name, but soon they started talking and texting on other topics. They didn't stop even after his wife found out about it. Rodney said he and Mindy sometimes talked 20 times a week. He claimed that most of the time, Mindy called him herself. Rodney said Mindy was like a daughter to him. When he heard the terrible news about what had happened to her, he was shocked. He just wanted to talk to Mindy one last time so he left a message on her voicemail. For investigators, these emotional voicemails didn't make Rodney any less suspicious. It was probably the other way around. Although investigators did not believe that Mindy had a romantic relationship with her ex-boyfriend's father, 
it was possible that he became dangerously obsessed with her. Rodney provided the police with his DNA. They asked him again and again about his whereabouts that day. He said he worked on the farm with his two sons from 7.30 a.m. until evening. Rodney's family confirmed his alibi, and investigators released him. They sent the sample of his DNA to the lab for comparison with the skin particles found under Mindy's fingernails. While the police were searching for the person responsible for Mindy's death, the residents of Valley City started to worry about their safety. Many were afraid to go outside, knowing that the one who took Mindy's life was still at large. Mindy's funeral was six days after her death. The coffin was placed in the school's gym, as the church would not accommodate everyone who wanted to say goodbye to her. The police, dressed in civilian clothes, also attended the funeral ceremony. They were supposed to keep an eye on everyone because they thought the person who took Mindy's life would also be there. The police instructed people to take photos and videos of everyone to see if anyone would behave strangely at the funeral, but this tactic did not bring results. The police had run out of suspects and therefore, all that was left to do was wait for the results of the DNA tests of all the suspects. However, they discovered some interesting information even before the DNA results. It happened after the experts analyzed the DNA found under Mindy's fingernails and entered it into the federal database. Two years before Mindy's death, someone attacked a woman in Fargo, North Dakota, 75 miles from Valley City. The person who attacked her forced her to make contact with him. I'm going to call what happened by that word, but I think you all know what I'm talking about. So the police had a DNA sample of the suspect, but this case remained unsolved. At that time, there was no information about this person in the database. Now, it turned out that the one who took Mindy's life and the one who attacked the woman in Fargo were the same person. It meant that this person was not going to stop. The police needed to find him before someone else got hurt by his actions. They didn't have the person's name, but the Fargo case could push forward the investigation of Mindy's death and provide new leads. The police investigating the case of Mindy Morgenstern met with a woman from Fargo to try to find out from her any details about the man who attacked her. She was only 22 years old at the time and she planned to become a teacher. One evening, she was hanging out with friends. They went to a bar, talked, had fun, and drank alcohol. She told her friends she wanted to go to the bathroom. That was the last thing she remembered. When she regained consciousness, she found herself pinned to a mattress in an unfamiliar apartment. She was lying on her stomach, and a man she had never seen before was on top of her. He put his hand over her mouth so she couldn't scream. She tried to resist, but the man was twice her size. She thought it was the end of her, but this man let her go. She was barefoot, her clothes were messy, and her purse was missing. She went to the police and described the man who attacked her as a muscular African-American, over six feet tall and weighing over 200 pounds. They couldn't track this man down, but they had a sample of his DNA. The Fargo police entered this DNA into the federal database and waited. But two years have passed, and this case remained unsolved. But now it was evident that this man had committed a new attack, but this time with a fatal ending. Investigating the case of Mindy Morgenstern, the police collected several DNA samples. The lab has been working overtime to process these samples. After conducting a thorough analysis, the experts contacted the investigators and reported they found a match. The one who took Mindy's life was one of the men who provided their sample voluntarily. It wasn't Mindy's ex-boyfriend Kyle or his father Rodney who aroused a lot of suspicion. The skin found under Mindy Morgenstern's fingernails belonged to 34-year-old Mo Gibbs, a corrections officer at the Barnes County Jail. Mo has come a long way from his early life as a member of the Crips gang in Central California to serving in the U.S. Navy. He was married and had children. He lived in Fargo, but after the divorce, he moved to Valley City and worked as a college guard before getting a job at Barnes County Jail. Since he worked in law enforcement, he was familiar with the investigators involved in Mindy's case. He seemed like a good guy. Therefore, everyone was surprised that the DNA sample under Mindy's fingernails belonged to Mo Gibbs. 
The investigators decided to lure Gibbs to the police station. They called him and said they wanted to ask him some additional questions. He was under covert surveillance in case he decided to run away, but he showed up at the police station at the appointed time. Before informing him that they found his DNA under Mindy's fingernails, the police offered Gibbs to take a polygraph test. He agreed and answered all the questions, but there were some signs of lying on his part. Gibbs stated he had nothing to do with Mindy's death. After learning about the DNA match, he remained calm and claimed he wasn't the one who took Mindy's life. When the police told him that his DNA linked him to the Fargo case, he grinned but said nothing. The evidence obtained was enough to arrest him. Mo Gibbs was handcuffed and formally charged with taking the life of Mindy Morgenstern. They then subsequently charged him in the Fargo case. After news about his arrest went public, five female prisoners reported that Mo Gibbs had forced them into intimacy for several months. It all happened when Gibbs was on duty. Thus, the police charged him with six more counts. It seems rather strange that a man who served a prison sentence was first hired as a college guard and then as a corrections officer at the Barnes County Jail. But there's an explanation for this. None of Mo Gibbs's employers suspected that this was not his birth-given name. He changed his name at some point. Before becoming Mo Gibbs, he was Glendale Morgan Jr. When he was in the Navy, he was involved in a drive-by shooting and spent more than five years in prison. During the trial, Gibbs's lawyers came up with the theory that his DNA ended up under Mindy's fingernails because she touched the same door handle as Mo. According to the defense, Mindy's boyfriend, Jordan Raynham, was the one who could have harmed Mindy. Gibbs pleaded guilty to all charges except those related to Mindy's death. Neither his fingerprints nor DNA were on the knife that injured Mindy. But prosecutors explained this by saying the cleaning agent had destroyed all traces. The prosecution believed that Gibbs entered Mindy's apartment right after her to force her into intimacy. She started to resist, and he lost his temper and took her life. To destroy the evidence, he doused everything with the cleaning agent. Gibbs stated that he would not have voluntarily provided his DNA sample if he had been the one who took Mindy's life. On July 12, 2007, the jury failed to reach a unanimous decision. Therefore, there was a new trial that took place four months later. This time, the prosecutors have prepared better. They involved several DNA experts to refute the lawyer's claim that Gibbs's DNA ended up under Mindy's fingernails because she touched the same door handle as him. At the trial, experts testified that such an amount of DNA could have gotten under Mindy's nails only during a vigorous physical contact. Gibbs's cellmate also testified at the trial. He said that Mo confessed to him that he had taken Mindy's life. Moreover, he said he would do it again if he had the opportunity. After 27 hours of deliberation, the jury found Mo Gibbs guilty on November 20, 2007. When asked whether he had anything to say before sentencing, Gibbs, 35, maintained his innocence and told Judge John Paulson, My heart, my prayers go out to the Morgan Stern family. This is terrible, and it never should have happened, and I apologize that it happened. The judge, however, said the evidence was overwhelming that Gibbs had strangled and stabbed Mindy in the neck and then poured Pine Sol cleaning fluid on her face and torso. He denied Gibbs's request for a new trial. The court sentenced him to life in prison without parole for taking the life of Mindy, plus 12 years for assaulting a woman in Fargo and another 15 years on other charges. Mindy Morgenstern's mother, Eunice, said a few words to Gibbs after the sentencing. She looked at Gibbs and said, Mr. Gibbs, I forgive you publicly here. I also want you to know that I won't forget what you did to Mindy. She ended her comments by telling Gibbs, my heart goes out to his family and children. Gibbs said, thank you. Gibbs remains incarcerated at the North Dakota State Penitentiary in Bismarck.